continue. Cool. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks, Charlotte and Fiona, for organizing this. Um, I'll kind of wander through the slides. Feel free to answer any questions that you have uh, when you go uh, as I go through. Um, so uh, we're excited to be uh, going uh, direct into the UK uh, in terms of with the KBMO testing. Uh, and Charlotte's kind of uh, leading the charge. So uh, as I say, when we get to the bit about where you send the kits to and all those good things, um, Charlotte, I'm sure better help, but I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll kind of wander it through and uh, just give you a bit of background on the technology, how it's a little bit different uh, in terms of from other tests you might've seen. Uh, and then we'll go through some of the new products we've got coming through as well, which we're uh, really excited to kind of uh, get going in the UK as well. So again, we'll start with, again, I think the real, the real difference between us and I think some of the other tests out there You've got a lot of people looking at the IgG one through four in terms of on the food sensitivities, but what we're also doing, we're, look, we're looking at inflammation. So we also look at complement activation via the C3D marker. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. And then thirdly, we're also looking at gut permeability um, or leaky gut, depending on who you're speaking to. Uh, and so the idea there is that we measure that in three different elements. So if you've got more than 10 foods elevated, that's always a bit of an in indicator that maybe something going on there. We also measure candida and I'll, or candida. I can now say that properly, given I've got a UK audience. Uh, and um, the third one is zonulin. So I'll talk a little bit, a bit more about that as we go through. So just to kind of set the stall in terms of what we're looking at, um, we're very much focused around food sensitivity. Um, food allergy uh, is obviously uh, IgE, instant, and generally bad things happen straight away. So it's generally easy to work out which food may well have been the offending item. With food sensitivity, it's that delayed nature which makes it much more complex for a patient to work out. So the delay can be up to 72 hours. So again, for most patients, it's really tricky to work out what it was they might have consumed in a 72 hour period that led to the symptoms that they present with. And again, with food sensitivity, the symptoms are many and varied. So the good news is we've got now over 10,000 providers around the world running the test. Um, so we often can ask them, you know, what, what, you know, describe a good patient or maybe not a good patient, but one who's got uh, applicable to have the, uh, the food sensitivity testing run. Uh, and so all these symptoms you can, as you can see, are, are kind of many and varied, obviously digestive, skin related, um, brain fog, fatigue, and um, you can definitely put weight loss in here as well and cardiovascular. But again, the key here is in terms of when we ask them, so the when, the why is because again, the inflammation that's associated with foods is an un underlying problem for many of the conditions that you guys see on a, on a daily basis. And so really what this test is trying to do is identify on an individualized basis, which foods are causing that inflammation by eliminating those foods, then generally what you're seeing is a reduction in those symptoms, and then good things start to happen in terms of an improvement in the health of the patients that you see. As I mentioned up front, we're looking at a kind of multiple pathway approach, and that kind of sets us apart, because again, you'll see uh, a lot of great companies out there are looking at IgG only testing, but the limitation with that is not them, but more importantly, that pathway. So when you think about um, the immune system, what the IgG is doing is it's really measuring which foods you're exposed to. So again, it tells you which foods you're exposed to, which is interesting, but as we all know, just because you're eating something doesn't necessarily mean that that's a problematic food. And so um, that's why rather than just stop at that, we also then go on to the next level, which is looking at an inflammatory pathway as well. So we're measuring a downstream part of your immune system, which is the complement activation, which is the inflammation. And so that generally correlates much more tightly with symptoms. So what you're seeing is rather than saying, let's let's you know come up with a long list of foods, which is what the patient's been eating, what we're doing is we're eliminating those, what we would describe as false positives and really zeroing in on the key foods of interest, which are the ones which are much more likely to be linked with the symptoms that they're presenting with. I'm showing a slightly different format here. Um, the cartoon which shows the ELISA plate which generally has 96 wells on it. On the left hand side you'll see the IgG only testing which is looking at that single pathway. On the right hand side you're seeing the uh, IgG 1 through 4 plus the complement activation and that's where we see the kind of the real benefits because it not only is enhancing the sensitivity of the testing but also the specificity in terms of the zeroing in on those key foods of interest. 
A little bit of brief background uh, on uh, KBMO. Um, we were founded by a gentleman called Dr. Brent Dorval. Um, his not insignificant claim to fame was he invented the first rapid HIV diagnostic. And so that percolates through the company in a number of different ways. So for example, we run 15 standards of controls per patient to make sure the testing is highly accurate and highly reproducible as well. Um, we're based here in Boston, as you can all tell from my very strong Boston accent. Um, we've got a number of uh, facilities here and we have an R&D facility. Um, we have, to have an FDA registered manufacturing facility and we have two clear high complexity labs. So all the testing that we'll have from the UK is uh, finger stick. And the great news for you guys is that the, the testing is stable for up to 30 days. So again, uh, we'll talk about how we ship it uh, into you guys in the UK. We've got a location in the UK where all the tests will come to and then we'll be FedExing that uh, on a weekly basis back to the US. So turnaround time will generally be seven to 14 days um, from us receiving the sample. And then that will be then disseminated back to you via Charlotte in terms of we can talk about that as we go through. Um, the company is set around a patent we had granted in 2012, which is that multiple pathway uh, technique that I was talking about earlier. So looking at the IgG, but then overlaying it with that complement activation, which again, gives us that specificity which I think is really helpful for patients in terms of eliminating those false positives and giving them a clear guidelines of what they need to be looking at. Then again, we've grown internationally now. So as I say, we're, uh, we have 10,000 providers here in the US and we've also got labs now in Mexico, Brazil, Shanghai, and also recently Be Beijing. So again, we have three panels that we offer for the foods we test. So again, that's probably, oh, go back on. Um, and so the the, uh, the FIT22 is uh, is looking at the 22 most common foods. Uh, the FIT132 is the orange foods plus the green foods on this slide. And then the FIT176 is everything on this slide. We'll talk a little bit more about the FIT176 as we launch that uh, in, the, uh, in the UK. So in terms of the patient report, um, again, it's very straightforward. And so that's intentional. And there's some clearly some very complicated science behind it, but the idea is to make it simple for you, a busy provider and your patient, so that if, it, if we make it straightforward enough that they can understand it, then the idea is that hopefully they'll be compliant to it as well. Um, one of the other key differences we've got is colorings and additives, and we're measuring those as well. And so that's really helpful in terms, if you think about most patients, um, we'd love them all to be eating organically from their gardens, but unfortunately that's not the case. Um, so again, what we see um, is a lot of processed foods, especially through the pandemic. Uh, lots of people eating a lot more processed foods than they probably would have wanted to. The other thing about the colorings and additives, you find those in supplements and you also find them in personal hygiene products. So again, it's worth pointing that out when you go through uh, with patients. I had a, uh, a lady the other day who is a, a, a vegan. She was very upset, chicken and duck came up on her report. But then we went through her supplements and it turned out she was she was um, taking collagen, which obviously was the clear link back. So again, never forget what they're taking. It's not just what they're consuming, but it could be the supplements and some of those personal hygiene products as, as well. So again, as I mentioned, we're looking at um, leaky gut. And so the way we do that is, are there more than 10 foods elevated? And how we describe those 10 foods are, are there more than 10 in the orange, the red, and the yellow? Um, the other one I mentioned is, is the candida elevated. And so we measure that on each of the panels. And so again, the way we're measuring that is we're looking at the IgG and the complement. So again, it's not a stand, a classical kind of candida test. It's more one to say, if both, if, if it's elevated on the panel, then it probably is indicative that there's some kind of leaky gut. And the way we know that is because there's a candida overgrowth in the stomach. That typically happens when you see a change in pH, which is caused by leaky gut. So it's just a way of giving you an indicator of, again, obviously clinical symptoms, but more importantly, is that elevated to give you a sign there as well, plus the more than 10 foods. And the third element that we look at as well is zonulin. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation. So again, one of the other things we spent a lot of time doing, and we probably haven't um, publicized it uh, in terms of how we were selling the test in the past, but we provide um, a number of key compliance tools. So one of those uh, is the meal plans, which are now 
included on the FIT 132 and the 176. So it gives you a way of having an individualized meal plan for each of your patients. So rather than just saying, here's a patient report, good luck avoiding those foods. The idea with us is to say, look, good news, bad news. Good news is there's a very short list of foods you'll have to eliminate. And more importantly, here are some suggestions of what you might want to consider eating going forward. And so again, lots of providers have liked that because again, it gives a pathway forward for the patient and helps with their compliance. Whereas currently that doesn't happen if you just give them the report. The second element that we've kind of worked on is the phone app. And again, on here, they get the meal plan. So again, if they're, uh, if they're shopping online or other way, otherwise, then they've got access um, to the meal plan. So that's very helpful in terms of, from that perspective. We show them their full test results. So again, if they want to check those out, they're there in terms of, as importantly, what they were sensitive to, but more importantly, what they weren't sensitive to. So they can see that full list and they have easy access to that, access to that on their phone. The other element um, as well is we've got the, um, you know, people love to share this with their friends and family. So we found that re really helpful in terms of the referral tool for, your, for, for the practice is, you know, what else is going on and, you know, and they'll talk to their friends and family about it. For each of the foods they're sensitive to, we also give them what that might cross react with, where they might find it and alternatives and substitutes as well. So it gives them just a little bit more information, but just about the foods they're sensitive to. We also have a provider's guide, which has that for all 176 foods, colorings and additives that we test for. And Charlotte will be happy to send that out to anyone who's interested in getting a copy of that as well. So we have that electronically, and that's a really useful guide in terms of going through that with patients. Generally, what we say with cross reactivities, we don't generally introduce that to patients straight off the bat on the basis we've done a great job of narrowing it down to the key foods. So let's not necessarily burden them with too many things around cross reactivity to start with. But if they're not seeing an improvement and maybe it happens in 10, 15% of patients, then at that point, look at reintroducing the kind of the whole concept of cross reactivity at that point. We've got the pricing here in the UK. Um, the wholesale price is clearly what you guys are paying. And then the recommended retail, again, that varies in terms of you know, what you would suggest. Um, the ones in red um, are, you know, another thing we've introduced is um, to give you guys an opportunity to try the test yourselves. Um, so there's a discounted test for, uh, re um, for, for providers and kind of friends and family or you know, people who are working in your office. So the idea is the more people who've tried it in the office makes it much easier or more, more likely um, for them to be able to kind of um, explain the testing to their uh, to the patients that you guys see so uh, that's a new thing that we've added uh, as well as the pricing has uh, we've decreased it by about 50 pounds test so again the idea is to pass that on to the providers uh, and again uh, hopefully that'll uh, make the testing a bit more attractive to patients um, who are looking at uh, getting the food sensitivity testing done uh, all uh, products can be drop shipped and uh, Charlotte's in charge of that. So again, um, she's happy to kind of uh, walk anyone through who's in interested in getting uh, drop shipping uh, kits to uh, each individual uh, provider or patient more importantly. So the billing and ordering, again, there's really two ways we do it. Um, you know, there's a month that you can pay bill monthly. So you can pay us at the end of the month. So again, we can ship kits out and then those can come back to us. And then the other way is, again, if we're drop shipping kits directly to patients, generally we're asking for payment up front on that. But again, Charlotte can walk people through that in terms of how she's doing that on an individualized basis uh, in the UK. And again, uh, we'll update this slide with uh, Charlotte's details, um, but you can always contact us in the US. Um, maybe not before lunchtime, but after lunch, uh, we're probably dangerous in terms of being helpful. So again, in terms of the, uh, some of the new products that we've developed, uh, we've got the FIT 132, uh, the 176 we'll talk about, Zonulin, and also the FAST test in terms of one of the newer uh, in-office tests that we've developed as well. So in terms of the FIT 132, um, we've made some changes in terms of taking some of these foods off that maybe have been on there historically for a long time and added some things which I think are a bit more relevant. Um, certainly in terms of the whey, whey protein, I know it's certainly here in the US, we have lots of people drinking whey protein shakes. So again, it's important to kind of call that out in terms of when you think about that as a dairy product, obviously quinoa, lamb, sea bass, and butternut squash as well. Um, 
We haven't, we're just really launching it now, but uh, into the UK uh, is the Fit 176. And so the idea with this was uh, we worked with over 150 providers to try and get an idea of what else they'd like to see included in the panel, um, given that you know people's diets are changing kind of in a pretty, a pretty rapid pace. So after working, as I say, with those 150 people, we came back with this list of an additional 44 foods. So I think some of the highlights are some of the ancient grains we've added, certainly in terms of sweeteners, so stevia, monk fruit. As we've discussed earlier, a lot of these patients are inflamed. So we've included the three main fish, which are included uh, in terms of omega-3. So again, we wanna make sure that that's the case. Um, I'm not sure if CBD is, uh, is legal yet in, in, in the UK, um, but uh, in, the UK, in, uh, in the US, it's legal in pretty much every state now. So again, we're testing that because again, it's been widely prescribed. So again, we wanna see how people respond to that. Um, and what we found so far is that this additional panel works really well for kind of almost two very disparate groups of patients. So patients who are very, very healthy, they're eating a lot of these things on a regular basis anyway, in terms of whether that's chia seeds, Brussels sprouts, kind of kale, these types of foods. So they want to be tested for those. But what we've also found is for patients who are certainly post pandemic are looking to have a major reset in terms of the types of foods and diet that they have, then this wider um, list of foods has been really helpful from the meal planning side that we can provide them with. So again, that's where it's been interesting for us to see, like anything, whenever you launched it out um, to all our providers, they come back with some really interesting feedback. And so I wanted to share that with you in terms of the types of patient who really enjoyed using the, uh, the bigger panel. So then moving on to Zonulin, um, we introduced this a number of years ago um, and really because we really like the fact it's a great marker for in intestinal permeability. Clearly most people who are running a food sensitivity test, they're looking to heal the gut. So let's give you a marker of intestinal permeability as part of the food sensitivity test that we do. The other thing we liked about it is it's reversible. So again, the patient isn't doomed if they have elevated Zonulin, it just gives you a very clear way or pathway forward in terms of um, the kind of treatment regimen you might want to consider. So clearly removing the foods and then putting them on, on some kind of gut healing protocol. But there's a lot more logic when you suggest that if you can show them their elevated zonulin results, especially when you kind of build into the fact that it is a reversible test. So again, the good news is if you're compliant, then you'll see uh, a difference in terms of the results that you get. And thirdly, um, an elevated zonulin level, yes, is highly indicative of some kind of leaky gut, but more importantly, it's also a bit of a canary in the coal mine for overall health. So what we're seeing is um, when you went through the kind of uh, clinical literature recently, all these disease states were also linked with elevated zonulin. So again, kind of important to look at it from a perspective of a bit of a canary in the coal mine when it comes to overall health, if they've got an elevated zonulin level. Again, in terms of a bit probably like our food sensitivity test, we've looked at coming up with a next generation zonulin test and working with kind of the best in class uh, within that. So again, if you haven't heard um, uh, Dr. Alessio Fazano speak about zonulin, um, it's definitely worth uh, a kind of scroll through, uh, you know, uh, some of the kind of studies out there because he's really uh, entertaining and really breaks it down into a very straightforward way for people to understand. Um, so again, he discovered zonulin and its links with leaky gut about 20 years ago. And so he's really excited to see this new assay that we're developing. And especially because rather than focusing on the antibodies, it's, it's highly specific to the zonulin protein. And so that's really the key here is it'll give you a very highly specific response. Is that zonulin present or not? And that's not frankly the case with some of the assays out there today. So again, um, this we're hoping to launch in kind of September, October time in the UK. So as we do, um, again, Charlotte and myself, we look forward to kind of uh, in, you know, letting everyone know about that coming out. The neat thing I think um, more importantly for you guys as providers is we're gonna include that on all three of the panels that we offer. So whether that's the FIT 22, the FIT 132 or the FIT 176, they will all have that zonulin included. So again, we hope that that's a nice addition in terms of when you're trying to work with those clients, how that's gonna work. So we're really looking forward to kind of offering that as an added benefit in terms of the people running the, our food sensitivity test, that it gives you a really clear way of trying to identify you know, what leaky gut might be going on. 
So last but not least, um, we've developed the um, FAST test. I'm not sure whether you can see this or not, but it's a little device um, that, uh, that we've developed, which will give you a way of detecting in office to see whether a patient is sensitive to egg, wheat, or milk. So that in essence, kind of like the big three. So the idea is if a single drop of blood, there's one single lancet that's required. Um, you take that drop of blood, you put it into a little um, vial like so, you invert it a few times, you pour it into this little device, you wait two or three minutes, that gets removed. And so there's a little colorimetric um, reagent goes in, that's poured into the device. And then hopefully as you can see there on screen, there's a change in color takes place in terms of around those um, three foods. So at 12 o'clock we have the control, then at three o'clock we have egg, six o'clock we have milk, and then nine o'clock we have wheat. And what we found is a really good way of testing patients in office who may be not necessarily convinced that food sensitivities are a problem, but if you can test them and get a result, which you do with this within 10 minutes, it's really helpful in terms of moving that forward. Or if your approach is all we want to do is an elimination diet, again, the compliance is likely to go up dramatically if you're testing for egg, wheat or milk and they're sensitive to that or they're not and they, can, they don't necessarily have to eliminate from their diet. So again, the idea is to give you a quick and easy um, compliance tool. And what we found is as patients run this, they're curious to go on and run the bigger panels. So again, it's a helpful one to, to kind of start running and give them some information see how they feel and generally what we've seen is uh, the curiosity of patients as they uh, you know they get moving on on the testing as well okay so in conclusion you know the real difference with this testing versus some of the others out there it's a multiple pathway kind of patented test so again as, as i mentioned up front it's not just stopping at the IgG, which again, anyone can get the test online, which just tells you about IgG. The reality is we take it to the next level, which then takes out those false positives and gives you a way of looking at this test, which really zeroes in on the key foods of interest, which are much more likely to be linked in with, this, with, the, um, with the patient's results. We've also spent a lot of time uh, on compliance tools. So again, we've got a number of key compliance tools that we see as well. Um, so again, the report's very straightforward. Um, the meal plan as well, I think we found is really helpful for patients. And lastly, I think the app, as I mentioned, from a, a referral tool for you as a provider uh, in terms of a, a compliance tool for the patient in terms of being able to kind of work that through. We've also done a number of clinical studies. Uh, we've looked at an IRB approved uh, clinical study looking at IBS patients. And we saw a dramatic reduction in the IBS severity score, as well as seeing a dramatic reduction in the high sensitive CRP that we saw for all patients as well. So again, that was good to see uh, not only symptoms improve, but more importantly, a reduction in an inflammatory response as defined by something like a high sensitive CRP, which every provider would, uh, would, would uh, understand. And then I think last but not least, Again, we've developed you know, these products which with world-class scientists in terms of Dr. Fasano, Dr. Dorval, uh, and as well as 150 of kind of colleagues of yours uh, who've come up with the FIT176 for us. So the idea is we're very much fit, um, sticking to what we know well, which is food sensitivity, and just excited to offer that now in the UK direct with the help of Charlotte now uh, to make sure that we can be on, on support and give you whatever you need to make sure the testing makes sense for you and also, uh, and also your patients. Any questions? Um, I have, oh, sorry. sorry, it's Amanda here. I have a question, if that, or a couple of questions, if that's okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. The first one is to ask how much blood is actually required? Because when we often talk about finger prick tests, it's not just a small amount of blood. And for some people, it is quite difficult to get a small vial of blood out of their fingers or the fingertips? Yeah, I mean, what, what we find is it's, um, I've got a card here actually, it's, it's, it's five blood spots is what we need. Perfect. Uh, generally for each of the panels. Um, and again, what we've tried to do is work on, as, lo as long as patients are hydrated. Great. Then, you know, that works really, really well. So, um, you know, if they're not hydrated or, and what we try and do is get them to, you know, 
wash their hands with warm water. Um, that's really ha helpful in terms of getting the blood flowing, move around a bit. Um, so again, generally we found that that works pretty well. I guess the worst, you know, not worst, but, you know, the other alternative is, you know, you can always put a line in and then drop, take the blood and then drop that onto a card as well. So, um, but generally we found that, you know, that, that most patients, as long as they're hydrated, they've got warm, warm hands, they keep their heart below their, you know, their hand rather below their heart and kind of rather than acting as a kind of, you know, a block if it's down then generally we've had a lot more success in terms of uh, patients doing that we yeah. and again during the pandemic we've been doing a lot of um, drop ships for providers and I, I must admit I've been pleasantly surprised the number of tests that have come back looking good so uh, as, a, as, a, as I say we've got an instruction card which has a YouTube video on it so again if you get the patient to watch that Generally, we've had a, a pretty high success rate in terms of patients being being successful in terms of getting the right amount of blood out. Sorry, Great, Charlie, yeah. On. No, that that's perfect. Yeah. It's just the other tests that I've had in the I've tried to do in the past with um, some clients. They it's a small vial and it's just too much for for some people. So the blood spot is perfect. I think. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think so. I mean, it's like I said, it's we've we've been doing it around the world now, and, and we've had a high level of success, which I've been, yeah, you know, a little bit surprised with. But again, I think we've tried to put some efforts in terms of like the the video, and, and things like that to make sure it's cl it's it's clear for people uh, what they do. And we we tell all the providers make sure your patient watch watches that video. And, and again, I think because people are invested in buying the tests. Um, they're normally pretty keen to watch the video and it's, you know, it's not war and peace. It's about three minutes. So it's uh, generally uh, most people's attention span is good for three minutes. Great. Thank you. Yeah, James, I was going to say about the um, collection. I mean, that, that's the question I'm, I've probably been asked the most this week and over the last three years on a regular basis. Um, and I think a lot of, a lot of the other labs, um, Amanda's right, that they're using those little tiny plastic Files where you have to practically milk your finger, then you with a bruised hand. And if you think, you know, I've got to do that for several tests. Um, and I think as well, because practitioners are ordering more of those finger prick tests and dry blood spot testing, um, people look at the cars and go, oh my goodness, I have to do that all in, you know, one sitting. But, you know, as, as James said, you know, you can, the, the car's very stable. Um, and also, you know, after a warm bath, you'll be amazed at how quickly the blood comes out of your finger. But if your hands are cold um, or you've just got out of bed or your blood pressure is a bit low, you, yeah, it is going to be quite difficult. But I think if you have a warm bath and you move around, it's amazing how much will come out. And you don't you don't need huge amounts. If it's just the spots on the card. Um, it's really quite easy. Um, we've also got a question. Um, asking if you have a client who has already done IgG testing, would you retest IgG and complement via the FIT test? Um, I, I think so, just because again, what, you, what you'd like to do for the patient is, is show some signs of success and you'll definitely see that if, if nothing else by the much lower number of foods will come up. So again, sometimes I think with, when you just do IgG testing, it's, it's frankly discouraging for patients because there's 20 plus foods that they have to eliminate. Uh, and they may be nodding, but you know, psychologically, they're going not a chance. Um, so the, the reality here is, I think, because because you're adding that inflammatory pathway, I think there's a lot more logic for a patient to do it. And so again, if you have to have that discussion with the patient, look, you know, no, you didn't necessarily waste your money just doing IgG. But the reality is, you know, we've just come out of a pandemic. We're all recognizing that we want to make sure we've got this, our immune health is as good as possible. So what this test will help you with is trying to identify which foods are causing you that inflammatory response. And what we've all recognized, you have to keep that inflammation down. So that's why you should run this test versus just be kind of maybe not so happy with just doing the IgG on its own. So when you look at the IgG plus the complement, you're focused on something which will give you, which will be looking to help your and aid your immune health versus just looking at food sensitivity. So I think that's a huge difference in terms of how you position that versus what's been going on. And as I say, here in the US, you know, nothing against the IgG only companies, it's more a, a, an issue with the pathway than the companies, but the reality is you'll end up with false positives because all you're me measuring is what you're exposed to 
versus what you really want to know is which ones are actually having an impact on my symptoms and that's i.e which ones are causing me an inflammatory response james i'm a i'm a classic example of that i've done just igg a year apart and i think i was probably 25 to 30 one year and then i was over 50 probably close to 60 the following year and yeah. um yeah i mean i was just not compliant at all you can't cut out that many foods and when i looked down at it, it was just everything i was eating a lot yeah. of so it's kind of like you can't and i you know i don't eat dairy and i don't eat gluten i don't eat other stuff so it's like suddenly asking somebody to take out ton more foods it's impossible mm -hmm. Yeah, as I as I used to not really joke, but say it's you know it's bread and water. Oops, no bread. Um, so you know yeah, that's, exactly. that's basically what you were getting down to. And and so I, I think as I say, it's discouraging. And and I think, frankly, from a provide, provider standpoint, it doesn't pass the red face test. I mean, you know, if you're telling a patient to take out that many foods, I think it's you know, a you know that that's not frankly accurate. And b you know it's from a psychological standpoint for the patient. As I always you know talk to providers your job is more of a, a psychologist nine times out of 10 in terms of telling them that this is what we're trying to do. This is how we're going to move you forward versus necessarily just giving them a, a report and expecting them to kind of follow through on it. So um, I absolutely agree, Fiona. I mean, that's basically the difference here is that we're, we're giving you that additional tool and piece of information, which helps guide you, know, you through the process, whether that by actually getting you down to the key foods that are linked back to your symptoms and then the compliance tools on top of that. Because again, I think generally people want to be compliant, but as you say, even in your case, you know, there's no way you're gonna take 25 foods out of your diet. And that's, you know, that's not a reflection on you. That's just a reflection on, like I said, it's that pathway is the issue, not the companies uh, or, or the patients who are being made to run them. Mm. Yeah, the other question I have is around, what's the kind of timeline for how long you should be having eaten something before it just wouldn't come up because you're not eating it. So for like, we get a lot of clients that are already off gluten and dairy. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, generally, generally what we say on that is, you know, we, we don't suggest people, you know, if whatever they're currently eating, you know, we're trying to test you to see what's in your current diet that is causing you the symptoms that you're wanting to come in and see a provider for anyway. However, you, know, you give a great example as people now who've taken out gluten or they've taken out dairy, and so generally what we suggest is, you know, if they want to test those foods, you know, and as I said, I would say 90% of patients are the ones where don't change anything. But if some people have taken you know, those groups out, reintroduce them, you know, 72 hours before you're going to run the test, run, you know, in, eat them, have some kind of exposure to them in that time period, run the test. And then hopefully we'll be able to kind of from that give you a good indication of, you know, have you healed the gut sufficiently that you can now actually, you know, eat, consume some of those foods on a more regular basis? So that's generally what the advice we give. But the, the vast majority of patients, you know, will say, like, just don't change your diet. We're trying to get to the kind of what is it you're currently eating is causing the symptoms that you're presenting with, uh, you know, when they come in and see you. Okay, thank you. I'm very interested to see what mine what mine come up as because I I've done com I've done compliment a long time ago like ten years ago, and that worked for me that I found my immune system my prey levels came down so yeah. that was a long time ago and I still have I still have some reactions so I'm looking forward to the results good good you should, well, you should get your test either tomorrow or Friday Fiona yeah. Well, I've been, oh yeah, I've been popping gluten and dairy back in sporadically, so uh, we can see. Can I just ask um, when, because you mentioned about the um, the launch in September, October with Zonulin. Are yep. the, so, so, so that's when Zonulin, Zonulin is included in all the tests. So at the moment, Zonulin isn't included in all, in all the tests. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it, it, it's an additional price. So the idea is we'll roll okay. it into the, the price. So in the, you know, it's a, we'll probably have a small increase. Um, I think it's 90, I can't remember, I think, let me just see. Excuse me for not remembering the UK price list there a minute, but let me just quickly flick back to I think it. that was 75 uh, RRP and 50. Yeah. So I think what the idea is, we'll probably charge 15 or 20 pounds, something like that, and just roll it in. 
So okay. again, the idea is that, you know, there'll be a small charge for it, but it'll be a very small charge uh, in terms of increase in terms of when we include it in the panel. Um, okay. So and uh, if, we, if we've run, if we've run tests with clients over the next few months before the Zonium one, can we get it as a standalone for those clients or? Yeah, I think absolutely. For those ones, I'm happy, you know, again, the, the idea is we're happy to help wherever we can on that front. So, yeah. So, uh, again, it'll ho hopefully uh, not, I'm not sure what spurs on R&D teams, but if that spurs on our R&D team, oh, that'd be great. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're very close to getting it concluded. So, uh, I know they've got it working really nicely in Serum. So, that's the slight delay for the UK because obviously we want to keep it, um, keep it on the blood spot cards versus the, uh, the Serum. But I can tell you, we were one. We were the first company in the U.S. offering um, COVID antibody tests on, on dry blood spots. So again, we've got the guys who have the, the kind of skill sets in terms of Dr. Dorval to help kind of make that work. So as I say, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic that September and October are, are a realistic kind of goal line for that timeline for that rollout. And can I ask one more question? Sorry to keep yeah. asking. No, no, that's fine. Um, with the fast test, uh, yep. you mentioned egg and milk. Is it the casein in those that's being tested? Do you know? So, um, so we're me measuring kind of it's it's almost like six in one in some respects because for the for the um, wheat it's whole wheat and gluten. For the egg, uh, it's egg white and egg yolk, uh, and for the milk, it's whole milk and milk casein that we're uh, comparing it to. Yeah. So, both, I guess, for, for, to answer the question, so it's milk is the casein. Yeah. Great, thank you. No, no problem. So we it's been interesting. We've rolled it out in New Zealand and Australia and people have, uh, have, have been really in, in excited by it. Uh, we're now um, looking at Canada. Um, so I, f I, feel, I feel like I must be a member of the Royal Family. We're doing a Commonwealth tour or something, but it's, uh, you know, that, that, that's how it seems to have worked so far. And we'll, uh, we're, we're looking to kind of get it through the FDA here and then we'll, uh, we'll launch it in the US. But more importantly, we can be looking to roll it out as well uh, in the UK. Thank you. And then Clotilde just asked, is it always raw or cooked or both? It's a bit of both. Um, it's, it's an interesting one. We've, we hear the kind of raw and cooked. Um, yes, there's a difference because there's, there's a denaturization of the protein. We've run many hundreds of thousands of tests now. And so um, it seems to correlate well with clinical symptoms. And I think that's probably the kind of gold standard. Uh, I know there's a difference in the denaturization uh, when you cook something. Um, I haven't yet seen any papers which show has that had any impact on clinical symptoms. And I guess that's probably our, that's probably the thing we look at um, versus, you know, certainly wouldn't disagree. There's a, there's a difference in the denaturization of a protein. But the reality is the way we've been running it, it um, from all the providers we talk to, um, they've been very ha happy with the kind of uh, the, the outcomes and the uh, in terms of the link with uh, the symptoms that their their patients are presenting with. I think the for, for me, um, what I really like about this test is um, the simplicity. It's straightforward. It's easy to understand. But I think um, it, it's the cost um, as well. You know, I think if you compare what you're getting in the 176 compared to similar tests on the market only compare their prices. I mean, they, they're, you know, world apart. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, although, you know, perhaps it's a great test. I think this really gives you the information that you can use because it's foods that people are eating. Um, and I think the inclusion of things like chia and goji and coconut oil is, is absolutely brilliant. Mm. Really, really good. And I think for some of the other tests, I just can't convince clients to pay like £1,500, especially not when a lot of money. this isn't the only test I'm normally recommending. Yeah. You know, mm. you're usually, if you're doing this, you're usually doing a stool test as well. And then Charlotte and I, we're quite often putting the Dutch in there as well. And I think it's, you know, you can't expect clients to spend over two thousand pounds in total on tests. Mm -hmm. They just don't have that kind of budget. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what it's we see. Be, it's got to... Yeah. Sorry. What we see okay. here in the US is lots of people are using this as, as a first up screening test. I mean, so you know, it gives you a really good directional idea of you know if you can link it to you know inflammation. And we've had a lot of providers that they'll run it on every every new patient just to give them some information. They see an improvement. 
and then from there they can almost triage onto some of the other testing that you just mentioned uh, and so it, you're absolutely right i mean you know that's a that that's an issue worldwide you know that you, you know not everyone can afford two thousand dollars for anything so the idea is giving trying to price it appropriately so you can use it as a screen on as many patients as possible um, rather than kind of make it a, an exclusive test it's more you know we're trying to make it inclusive from the pricing that we're offering yeah and we're all, we're all in the inflammation game aren't we yeah <laughs> with your case study slides inflammation 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 yeah. <laughs> inflammation <laughs> exactly okay. cool so again, we're excited to be uh, working directly. And so again, if there's anything you guys need, um, Charlotte's your point person. Dr. Dorval is always available as well. And he's he's um, he's really um, good at getting back to people. So again, you know, please uh, contact Charlotte if there's any questions. Again, she's a, she's a wealth of knowledge in her own right. But uh, again, if there's anything, then I think, you know, what we're trying to do is, is, uh, is speed up the response of, of time on, on everything and anything that we can. Uh, to make sure that uh, you know we uh, we can support the providers and your patients uh, in, in any way that you're looking for. Thank you, and I'll I'll forward um, the recording to you, Fiona, yeah. and um, I'll send along the uh, provider guide as well that James mentioned, which is really useful. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and Charlotte, well, I'll put your contact details on there so they know who to get a hold of. Brilliant. Well, thank everyone for their time. Much appreciated. Thanks for jumping on. And, thank you, James. Uh, thank you. Thanks, James. Hopefully first of many, and we'll look forward to uh, kind of communicating other new things coming out. Brilliant. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 I'm going to stop recording. Yeah, stop recording.